So good evening, everyone. Uh, great to uh, see so many of you with us um, taking up Dame Judith's challenge um, of being proactive uh, in embracing the Building Safety Act. Uh, and I'm just going to run through how we are preparing members for the Act. Next. Uh, so as Dame Judy said, this is more than just um, a piece of legislation that we have to comply with. This is really a once in a generation uh, opportunity uh, to, to really reform the industry. Um, so we're trying to understand what the aims of the Act are. So it is a new uh, and enhanced building safety framework, uh, which Tim has run through. Uh, it does bring new accountability and stronger duties, new competence requirements, a greater voice to residents, uh, and we've heard how that will get mirrored in the, the in legal uh, strengths that they have, um, a new framework for construction products, uh, and also an ombudsman uh, for new homes, uh, which is sort of less due to us, but still uh, with the Act. Next. So the, the Act uh, enshrines the recommendations of Dame Judith's report, Building a Safe uh, Future. Uh, and I do recommend that you read that. that that's um, a really great report. Uh, and it is just one lever being applied to bring about change. Um, so we have put together a roadmap for how we're preparing our members, uh, which covers the objectives of that Act, how that impacts members' everyday work, the timeline for the implementation, uh, what we're doing, how we're working with the rest of the industry to deliver that. One of the big um, emphasis of this act is that we cannot uh, remain in the silos that we have been uh, spoken about earlier, but we have to work together to ensure that buildings are safe uh, and that industry has competence uh, and how we're engaging with our members. Thank you. Next. So in terms of the timeline, uh, unbelievably, it's nearly a year since the uh, Act was passed um, in Parliament. Uh, it was April 2022. Um, in the 12 months till April 2023, uh, legislative changes are coming into place. So the Building Act 1984 is being changed. Uh, there is secondary legislation uh, that is coming through and will continue to come through. Uh, a building safety regulator is being set up uh, and there'll be something like 700 people in there who will oversee the entire building control regime and, uh, as Tim said, be the building control authority for higher risk buildings. Uh, and then between April and October, so really within the next seven months, we will really see the Act coming into place. The new duties on accountable persons will come into place. Gateways two and three for new builds will come into place, the golden thread. Uh, and also the National Construction uh, Product Regulator, uh, and also the mandatory registration of occupied buildings. And then following that, occupied buildings, occupied HRBs will get called in, uh, the safety cases will get called in over a five year period. Next. So how does that affect uh, what we do uh, on an everyday basis? Um, well, the Building Safety Act really affects four things. Roles, principal designer uh, and designer, and um, any structural engineer working on a high-risk building uh, will be a designer. Um, and we're defining what those roles are, and we're agreeing those with industry so that uh, there is a clear definition and there are no, no gaps. Uh, there are new competencies, technical competencies, but also behavioral ones. This is a cultural change that is being brought about. Um, there are significant changes to how projects are delivered, uh, and the three main uh, aspects of that are the golden thread, the gateway system, um, and the need for safety cases, uh, and also, fourthly, actually, uh, construction products. Um, and there are additional liabilities that our members need to be aware of. So what are we doing? We're defining uh, the scope uh, of those changes. We're developing CPD. We're generating test cases, and we need to work with members to do that. Um, and what are we producing? We're producing articles, webinars, guides, holding conferences as per today, uh, and also uh, generating CPD. Next. So in terms of the, the actions that are required and why, um, the guidance uh, will enable us to give information to our members uh, on what they should be doing. Uh, as Tim said, uh, and as Dame Julie said, really the expectation is on industry to set standards and industry 
um, to be proactive. And that's very important. It's not down to government to, you know, really tell us how we need to do our job. We need to step up and be very proactive in this. So we are producing guidance that will hopefully set the standard for compliance. Um, we're also identifying what the key competencies are going forward and producing guidance for our members on how they can meet those competencies, which will also allow principal designers and hopefully the building safety regulator to judge whether our members have uh, those competencies. Uh, importantly, there are new uh, technical competencies on structure fire safety um, and on disproportionate collapse. Uh, and we're looking to un ensure that we understand what those technical requirements are, um, but also define, again, the boundaries of our responsibilities with other members or with other organisations so that we ensure that there are no holes in the design of buildings. Um, we are collaborating with external bodies, other PEIs, to establish consistent benchmarks uh, and messages. So you won't get a, one message from us and then a different message from another PEI on what you should do. Uh, and again, to also make sure that the entire building design going forward um, is, is fully coordinated. Okay, next. So in terms of how we're doing that, within the institution, uh, we have a Building Safety Act steering group. So uh, that's myself. Uh, we have representatives from learning and development who generate uh, the uh, courses and the conferences uh, and also from the secretariat who write the guides. Um, we are liaising with other PEIs uh, and we're liaising with the regulator as well. And we're liaising with other PEIs through the CIC uh, and also directly. Um, we then um, produce briefs, uh, the steering group produces uh, briefing notes uh, on what the requirements of the legislation are. Uh, and those briefing notes uh, are then passed on to task groups, uh, which is made up of uh, committees, permanent staff, but also importantly, industry, who produce technical guidance and communications. Uh, following that, industry will produce test cases, particularly on things like uh, what goes into golden thread um, and what's in a safety case and gain experience. And what we want to do is feed that back into our technical guidance. So it is very, very important that we interact with, um, with members as we are today. Next. Okay. So looking at some of those um, elements uh, individually, what are we doing with compliance? Uh, we're defining the scope of the uh, act, how that applies to higher risk buildings uh, and what the changes are to building regulations. Uh, as was noted earlier, the duties um, apply to anyone doing build your building regulation work. Uh, we're also producing guidance on mandatory reporting and voluntary reporting. Uh, and Dame Judith made reference to the cross system earlier, which we'll just talk about. Uh, we're producing guidance on what the construction products regime will now um, encompass so that we can get that, or members can get that into their specifications. We're defining what the duties and roles are for the principal designer and designer. Uh, we're coming up with guidance on how you can demonstrate your competence. Uh, and also we are reviewing the primary and secondary legislation uh, and producing a summary of what the requirements are. Next. So uh, one of the key areas uh, which Dame Judith referred to was cross and uh, there will be a competence requirement to have knowledge of voluntary reporting systems. But the, the real point here is, is what are we trying to achieve with the voluntary reporting system? Uh, and that is really learning the lessons of the past um, and catching uh, things from near misses so that we can uh, avoid problems in the past. Um, also, there will be a mandatory reporting system set up. Um, so if members are aware of issues uh, that are significant, could lead to significant safety issues, they will need to be reported. So this is all about sharing knowledge, not burying things under the carpet, um, but learning so that we can improve things going forward. Next. Uh, so uh, you can sign up to CROSS uh, and that will help uh, demonstrate one of your competencies uh, if you scan the QR code below. Uh, and CROSS will give you guidance on safety issues so that you are aware of them going forward. Next. Okay, in terms of competencies, 
Uh, we've assessed the competencies that are required. Uh, industry's been working on that uh, since Dame Judith published her report. Uh, the Engineering Council have been leading that and we've had representative on the Engineering Council that have developed uh, a suite of competencies to um, design and construct higher risk buildings. And then they have been contextualized to requirements for structural engineering. Uh, and that's work which we've done with the ICE. So again, we're very consistent on that. Uh, they are behavioral competencies. So the competencies that we need as individuals, but importantly, which leaders need, which company directors need um, in, in managing their companies that design high risk buildings. Uh, there are technical competencies which predominantly relate to structural file design, uh, disproportionate collapse, uh, durability of buildings. Um, there are competencies around structural safety now. So um, this is engineers being able to assess new products as they come onto the market. Um, Tim made a fantastic point that this is about compliance with the functional requirements of the uh, building regulations, not just following the letter of the law, um, because new products may not be completely covered by the approved documents. So this is giving um, engineers and designers the skills to be able to assess whether systems and products coming onto the market will meet the functional requirements of the building regs. Uh, also, uh, one of the uh, key aspects, as uh, David mentioned, is we have 12,500 existing buildings to assess um, and we, we need to adopt the design risk management skills, which the HSE has been promoting for a long time now. So those are ALARP skills um, and looking at risk and hazard. And we will also need to prepare safety cases for new build HRBs as well. So this is look, taking a holistic view, as David said, uh, what might go wrong in a building that could lead to an event and how do we stop that? How do we control that? Uh, and we're coming up with guidance on how you do that based on existing HSE principles. Um, again, one of the other topics was not being siloed, but being aware of how buildings operate as systems uh, and particularly how the fire may interact with structures and how our discipline design uh, may interact with fires. So for example, uh, ensuring that the fire resistance of the building is consistent with the evacuation strategy. Um, also understanding the importance of secondary elements. So if there are partitions or barriers that are along safety routes, then they need to be properly designed as well. Um, and the industry will need to make sure um, that they are properly designed. Uh, as Mark said earlier, uh, we need to make sure that there is an assurance route for the design of those elements. Um, and what you'll see on, on the right side of these slides is what we're producing. So we're producing an article for that, we're producing guidance, um, and importantly, CPDs. Okay, next, please. Uh, the golden thread. Um, this is one of the main pieces of the legislation. Uh, so the golden thread, we are producing guidance, uh, and we've already produced um, an outline of that guidance, uh, which we're discussing with industry at the moment. The statutory requirements for golden thread, what must go into the golden thread, um, and that does change at stages from design, construction of handover, um, how that information should be structured so that it can be read in the future, um, and so that the important information can get picked out. Uh, the data management and protocol so that it is secure, um, but also meets the requirements of the Data Protection Act, and how we deal with changes, which is a, a major part um, of Dame Judith's report and also uh, the secondary legislation. So the, so the brief for that has been prepared at the moment, the briefing note, and that's been discussed with industry, um, and guidance is coming out shortly on that. Next. Uh, safety cases, uh, these are relatively new to the construction industry. Um, but they are uh, prevalent within other parts um, of industry. Um, and again, we are producing guidance um, and we've already uh, produced a draft of that guidance uh, along with the um, ICE on what the purpose and the aims of that uh, safety case and the safety case report is. Uh, the scope of our involvement, because this is a multidisciplinary um, design, so who will lead that and what our input is what the legal issues are uh, if we find existing defects in buildings, um, how we should carry out existing building assessments, um, and how we approach the difference between a safety case and a safety case report. Thank you. Next. 
Uh, the final big piece of guidance which we're producing is on the gateways. So describing the system, which was touched upon earlier, but then the content, the gateway two in particular, um, how we deal with things like subcontractor input. So the subcontractors may not have finished their design at gateway two, how do we deal with that? How we deal with changes, working with industry to develop uh, test cases, um, and how we deal with possible contractual liabilities. So what happens through no fault of our own if, we, um, if it takes a bit longer to get things through that gateway? Next. Um, as per the uh, legal discussions earlier, we're also looking at what the additional liabilities are uh, for members. So what the statutory liabilities are under the Act, um, the liabilities that may arise when we look at existing buildings for undiscovered defects. Um, also, potential liabilities for out of scope buildings. This is a, a culture change that affects entire buildings um, and best practice will be developed um, in designing HRBs. And it's very likely that, that that best practice will filter out to the rest of the industry and members need to be aware of that. Um, how we deal with possible delays, um, how we um, deal with uh, the new competencies that are required uh, and demonstrating that we have those um, and duties to residents. Next. Um, in terms of how we're doing that as well, uh, in, or getting the message over to our members, uh, as Victoria uh, said earlier, it is sort of quite a shocking statistic that a recent survey showed that 43% of respondents uh, were not aware of what was encompassed within the Building Safety Act. So uh, we have an engagement strategy. Um, we are, uh, say, collaborating with other PEIs, uh, particularly with or through the Engineering Council to produce information. Um, we are setting up task groups within industry, uh, and I would ask you to join those task groups um, to develop uh, test cases with us. Um, we are also communicating with industry through CROSS, um, and we're using web pages, the Structural Engineer magazine, webinars, and conferences. Next. Now, this is uh, an evolving um, landscape. We are producing guidance all the time. Secondary legislation is coming out and test cases is being developed. So we have a web page uh, and you can see the link there. Um, that web page um, already has a significant amount of guidance on it. Um, and we will keep updating that web page with guidance um, as, uh, as it is developed uh, and also as we gain more experience uh, as an industry. Um, so please do um, keep looking at that web page. Next. Um, and finally, um, just to sort of finish as we started with Dame Judith, um, I think say it's just, we need to reinforce that this isn't just about compliance with legislation. Um, this is about industry change. Um, and, you know, if we do have another Grenfell or if we have another scandal as per the Scottish schools, you know, how will society judge us? Uh, so what we are trying to do, as James Doody says, is bring a true and lasting change. Uh, and that's going to require a shifting culture. Thank you. <laughs>